Well, welcome everyone to today's webinar, Design Thinking, Building Cultures of Innovation. I am Andrea Whitlow, Senior Marketing Manager for NASCO, and I am pleased to be your host for today's collaborative session with innovation leaders from NASCO and X 2 as they share their experiences and expertise in design thinking. I'm so glad that you've joined us today to hear from Linda Lee Brock, NASCO's Vice President of Product Management, Anton Albermov, Director of Customer Experience for X by Two, and Ajaz Ahmed, Senior Technical Architect for NASCO. As they discuss approaches to creative problem solving in healthcare and detail how design thinking methodologies can solve complex user and business objectives. But before we get started, I do have a few logistical items to share with you. We have all attendees on mute throughout the presentation to create the ideal listening experience. You may not see the other attendees, but I can assure you they are on the webinar. If you have a question at any point during the presentation, feel free to chat that to me or the group or use the Q&A function. If we are unable to get to a particular question in the interest of time, we will be sure to follow up via, via email afterwards. We will also provide a recording of today's session to all attendees so you'll be able to go back and reference all of the key topics at your leisure. And with that, I will turn things over to Linda Lee. Well, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, good afternoon for your, those of you that are on the uh, Eastern Time Zone like myself. Um, we're very excited to be talking to you today about innovation because uh, we know for certain the healthcare industry has been going through the perfect storm and has shown us all that we can definitely go faster and do better than we had previously imagined. Companies all over the globe had accelerated roadmaps from three-year timelines to mere months, and healthcare in particular is feeling that pressure still. Uh, around how customers engage with healthcare systems, even how they receive care. We've seen a sustained trend from the pandemic around the use of digital and other emerging technology trends for care delivery. Things like telehealth and telemedicine that were previously minimally adopted, as well as newer technology and digital experiences like contactless office visits, self-service scheduling, wellness track tracking have really really change the paradigm in healthcare. And that means even more focus on the customers and end user experiences, making sure that we are making them more efficient, we're reducing the cost of care, but still creating that deep stickiness and impactful healthcare utilization. So innovation is key, business and technology innovation and breakthrough ideas are, are really coming about by leveraging existing and newly emerging technologies. So in today's session, we'll share with you an overview of the modes of innovation, how we were able to deploy and experience them, and how design thinking can really drive business and technology innovation for you. So Anton, let's start us off by walking us through application and types of innovation. Absolutely. Uh, so design thinking is ultimately a human-centered approach to innovation, right? It's anchored in understanding of customer needs, and it transforms the way we develop products, services, processes, and organizations. As you can see in this slide, there are many different areas for innovation within an organization. Anything from business configuration to products and services, all the way to the experience that we deliver to our customers. Really, anything that needs to be improved could be improved by utilizing this process. I believe that in the future of healthcare innovation, human-led details are going to make the world a difference. Just one breakthrough in design can transform experiences and change who has access to them. But as you can see overall, there's very many different areas that we look at. There it really exists anywhere within your organization or within your very specific job function. Thank you. <clears throat> Innovation lies at the intersection of what your users needs and desires, what the business demands, and what the technology can bring to life. So when we look at innovation within healthcare in particular, we find that there's three distinct areas that we focus on. That being customers, uh, in understanding the way consumers buy and use healthcare, because innovations in delivery of healthcare can result in more convenient, more effective, 
less expensive treatments for today's increasingly powerful healthcare consumers. And consumers want not only good products and quality care at a good price, but also ease of use. So we look at customers and we look at technology, uh, and we look at technology to develop new products, new treatments, and otherwise improve care, and look at IT innovations that connect the many islands of information in healthcare systems and can improve quality and lower costs. And we look at generating new business models, innovative business models, particularly uh, those that integrate healthcare activities, can, can increase efficiency, improve care, and save consumers a lot of time. Yeah, so yeah, so sometimes we think that innovation means experimenting with the new technology or building cool, artistic, imaginative uh, new websites or the user experience. Not really. In fact, the most important aspect of innovation is to ch challenge the status quo with the new idea. That is the key. Like the, what Uber did to taxi cab industry or Netflix did to Blockbuster with binge watching or um, in our healthcare, what telehealth and telemedicine did to doctor's office visits during the uh, pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So technology is just the enabler of that innovative idea. For example, on-demand uh, viewing technology or online streaming technology, or simply FaceTime that we use with our doctors so that technology was already there. So just using that technology to bring that innovative idea to life, that is what the innovation is all about. And it all has to be what our customers want, and that is what the human-centered uh, approach uh, to solving the problem is. Thanks, Ajaz. And that brings us to the design thinking process or the methodology. Uh, and it is, it is a repeatable, pro, uh, proven problem solving methodology that anybody can use. And it's made up of three key attributes, the solution attributes. First, it must be viable for business. It must be desirable by the customers. And it must be feasible to implement. And these are the three lenses that all ideas have been evaluated through and setting the design methodology on. And it combines creative and critical thinking that allows information and ideas to be organized decisions to be made, situations being improved, knowledge to be gained. And now it it's a mindset that's focused on solutions and not just on the problems and really getting to the core of what the users experience and what the right innovation should be. Well, we know a lot of different approaches uh, to stimulate new ideas and there, there's a lot of different processes and methodologies out there. Oftentimes, we find that innovation teams often struggle to apply them. Uh, I believe it's because our biases and the trace behaviors start to get in the way. And this is where the structured process of design thinking approach starts to come in to help us out. Primary element of design thinking is ultimately thinking about users and thinking about how to better solve people's needs. Uh, and that's where well, everything is ultimately being centered on. Interestingly enough, though, the methodology, even though it's geared to understanding and molding experiences for customers, also profoundly reshapes the experience of the innovators themselves. Uh, for example, immersive customer research helps us set aside our own views and recognize needs of customers that maybe they haven't yet expressed. Or carefully planned dialogues and conversations help us build new diverse ideas, not just negotiate compromises when differences arise. And experimenting with solutions reduces stakeholders' fear of change and helps us get in the way. I mean, it help, help us get on the way. The process is broken into five distinct areas. Empathy, empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. Empathy is the foundation of the human-centered design. The problems we're trying to solve are rarely our own, and we believe that those who are closest to the problems usually hold the keys to the answer. We need to build empathy with users early on by learning their values, whether they need to do in interviews, um, focus groups, research, working with subject matter experts, really trying to understand and putting ourselves in their shoes as much as we can. Define is where we unpack, unpack those findings into needs and insights and start to scope meaningful uh, conversations around them. Based on our understanding of the users and their environments, we can come up with actionable problem statements to focus our ideation on. Of course, ideation is where we generate many, many different ideas, uh, as radical as possible. It's a process of going wide in terms of concepts and in terms of outcomes. 
And the goal of ideating is to explore a wide solution space, again, both in quantity of ideas and the diversity of ideas. Prototyping is a critical step of the process. This is where we get to take our ideas out of our head and put them into the real world. It could be anything that takes physical form, a wall of post-its, a storyboard, an object, uh, keeping in mind that ideas are most successful when people can experience and interact with them. And testing is our chance to gather feedback, refine our solutions, and learn more about our users. It's an iter uh, iterative uh, process in which we place low resolution prototypes or really whatever we can to get our ideas out of our head and test them out in the real life scenario. And of course, as an outcome of these activities, we aim to create some kind of a solution pitch, a defined vision of our direction that we're trying to go in that we can share with leadership, share with our coworkers, get buy-in, and be able to move forward. Yeah, and uh, every time we go through this methodology and this process, so to say, often people confuse design thinking with visual design. Um, or sometime roll their eyes saying, oh, the same sticky notes on the wall process. That is not what design thinking means. It is as uh, Anton just mentioned uh, about the empathetic approach. Empathy is not a natural human behavior. It is a skill that has to be learned and gain uh, um, experience with. It is not something that comes naturally to us. Also, design thinking process teaches us to be uncomfortable by sharing unfinished product with the customers uh, and gain their ex feedback and their experience and get, gain some, you know, uh, some of their experience with that. So the, ultimately this process teaches us to change our mindset, to be more collaborative with the customers and with our fellows and creative and be creative and think out of the box. So that is what the design thinking process and methodology is all about. And it does work, the process does work at all sorts of companies, big and small. Uh, and it should be, this type of thinking really should be at the core of strategy development or in all sorts of organizations to drive cultural change and focus on solving problems. It can be a challenge to implement sometimes in large organizations that are uh, weighed by process and systems, uh, but the benefits of cutting through it outweigh the uh, complexity. And I really encourage everybody to at least try to implement it. And of course, for startups and smaller organizations, this process is yours to define and refine and make your own. Yeah, and the, and the problems that uh, can be solved can be both externally or internally facing issues as well. So that is the beauty of this approach. It's highly adaptable to the to the organization. So. Let's get into a little bit more about how to execute this, this framework and this process. So you can see that as we talked about um, engaging a workshop or a design session, we'll, we'll really start with a well-defined overall challenge statement. This is such an important component of innovation. It gives direction to the team without prescribing the path they take or the solution that they would derive. So typically the workshop or idea champion leads that definition process. For me, the most effective approach is to identify whether a challenge or an opportunity statement needs to be crafted, where an idea statement proposes an idea that would solve a problem and a problem statement articulates a problem and why it's worth solving. The most provocative statements are simple and evoke a feeling. Both type of statements should include who has the problem, what they need, um, and how and why it would be of benefit. It may also include why it's a priority. When I was in design thinking boot camp at Stanford, we rallied around a simple statement for our workshop. And the whole week statement was simply this reimagine healthcare for, for millennials. It's very high level. And it, it really demonstrates how the simplicity of that statement was still provocative enough and got an entire group of people rallied around the, the challenge. And it's also been said that a problem well, well put is half solved. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And it's, it's critical for teams as they come on a project to keep that uh, clear challenge statement in front of mind, in front of you at all step, steps of the way. It's easy as we go into the field and start learning about customers to start creating new ideas and find new opportunities 
it's easy as we ideate to come up with ideas that and directions that may sway us off our path. And that's why we need this type of our challenge statements to be clearly defined to keep us on the path and keep us focused as we're going through the process. I would say try to even over communicate and over empathize the statements. If possible, try to visualize it if you can, whether it's through some kind of a diagram or a poster or a picture, whatever it makes sense to focus people on what it is and keeping them mind we are visual creatures at the end of the day. So the more we can paint the picture, the better we'll be at uh, forming viable and valuable solutions around these challenge statements. Yeah, so let's dive into how design thinking can be implemented to solve the problems uh, for the organization where we bring a diversity of function and a diversity of thought to the table when we assemble our champions. For me, it's essential that the champions and members of your innovation team represent cross-discipline makeup. So that means across product, design, technology, human performance, as well as your customer, if you can. Uh, these folks will work together equally and bring their perspective and their ideas. And that the champion mindsets are also crucial. That means we foster a growth mindset among the team, a willingness to be curious, as Ajaz said, challenge the status quo, take risks, putting new ideas forward, engage in a democratic decision-making process. Uh, the participants will be, you know, need to be willing to invest the time and also focus, be very present in those, uh, those discussions and be able to embrace the methodology, which is, as we said, problem and focused user and person centric and very iterative. Yeah, it's very important to get the right players at the table at the onset of the project. Getting the correct mix of capabilities and backgrounds results in much more productive sessions and much greater outcomes. Uh, try to bring together representative of business, product, customers, design, development, subject matter expertise, and so forth to assemble your team. Even if you might know some folks that were part of similar projects on, on other teams, try to bring them into the mix if you can to just kind of uh, provide that lens. On, on their own, different functional groups usually tend to generate ideas that serve their group's needs much more than the customers, right? This is what we know. We know our little part of the world. So we want to come bring these folks together to come, to come uh, create as diverse of ideas and directions as possible. And I would say look for these uh, champions across many functions of the organizations. So you might be pleasantly surprised by certain members that already are a lot more dialed in, ask a lot of questions, uh, looking to break functional boundaries and advocating for uh, the customers. And they do right by customers already, right? And they live and breathe perfection from every day and they obsess over electricity. And this is why we want to find these folks and want to put them together on this team right away. And again, keeping it diverse. Yep. So centering on the customer, this is a mode of the innovation process where you hear the word empathy really get highlighted. And it's the foundation for human-centered design journey. Using empathy interview techniques, and we talked about they can be interviews or, or focus groups and other types of engagement, but we attempt to uncover problems by better understanding their thoughts, feelings, values, and even their motives uh, through some of those brief customer encounters. We typically try to have members of the team play the role of interviewer, note taker, or observer in, in the case of interviews. This allows the team to get both verbal and nonverbal insights, as well as prompt the interviewee along and go deeper with them on more probing areas with open-ended questions. From here, you can build out that, that user or that customer profile. And this really helps frame up not only why you know, various experiences presented highs and lows in that person's journey, um, but we can really frame that up and, and zoom in on those experiences um, to get more details. When we get to uh, more explicitly defining the problem to be solved based on these insights, this becomes essential. So this becomes the springboard for the idea generation in the next mode. And it should preserve the emotion that was noticed by the interview as much as possible. And that means capturing strong language, using verbatims from that user or that customer as much as possible. Use contextual examples or inferences if possible. That'll help you craft that point of view statement about the person or user that had the problem. 
Yeah, and clearly defining these profiles and journeys really do help unite us in the common vision for the problems need to be solved. Uh, these persona profiles should be built with gray care to capture only the most important aspects of the customer and the, and the behavior that drive insights of what matters most. So we need to, there's a curation process that definitely has to come with that. But profiles by themselves only tell part of the story. So we need to contextualize this by bringing them into journeys, bringing these folks into uh, real life scenarios that they're going through so that we can empathize and evaluate and be able to generate many different points of view. When we get into the op idea of generating many options, we talked about ideation. Inside of this, and this is my favorite mode of ide ide uh, innovation, we think of this activity as going wide, and you've heard this, but the idea is you come up with as many ideas as you can get. Get out of the box, and then we continue to build upon them as a team. We hold off being critical and, and instead continue to think of more possibilities. Um, in my role as a facilitator, I get to tell my team to come up with at least a couple of really outland outlandish ideas, and I may even uh, plan a few myself, but the idea is to get that out of the box thinking really going. Design thinking really does help us ideate and think about things a little bit differently and not solving the problems the same way every time. Um, this is very important. In this moment, we want to make sure we don't judge too soon. We generate as many, no matter how small of an idea may be, don't try to go and solve the whole thing all at once, but come up with many different aspects. And then we vote on these ideas, we uh, prioritize them, and these ideas start to build more ideas. And we want to extract these out of everybody's mind and again, be careful not to overanalyze at this point. So next we need to fine tune. And in a highly motivated team, you know, like we said, many ideas may emerge to be considered. And there's way to, ways to fine tune and uh, advance those ideas. We use voting techniques and they can be useful to uncover characteristics of the idea um, to make sure that they check the boxes. So. We need to make sure that the idea really addresses the problem the person is having. Um, sometimes it's a great idea, but it, it doesn't really go back to what we believe is the most important problem to solve. So we use a rating of either value or impact to identify that. We need to figure out if the idea is achievable or feasible with the technology or talent, funding, span of influence, whatever um, those characteristics are, but that can be done either through a rating of effort or time to deliver. And then you can also look at an idea through the lens of how, how able is it to really be a breakthrough idea um, in, the, in this exercise, something really breakthrough may be worth considering. Um, as a facilitator, I always test the ability for the idea to solve the problem or the, the person or the user's problem the most. It's not uncommon for a great idea to get, generate team excitement, but still fall short of really being that game changer for the person that they actually interviewed. Yeah, and once you have a few good options, they need to be embraced by the team and by the group. So don't let things like what happened in the past deter you from pursuing good ideas or previous experiences to stop you from pushing new types of thinking. Design thinking creates an environment that lets the new ideas grow, lets the group experiment without the threat of making mistakes, right? Sometimes options will need to be combined, refined, and several rounds may be needed to make sure that the right answer is being brought forward to solve the problem. But this is where, again, we start to push things together and find new ways to uh, tell a different type of story. So now that we've uncovered the essential elements of innovation, we wanted to showcase a real example of how we made innovation a central part of our organizational model and use that to guide our culture in a very real way. So for us, the foundation of our innovation journey at NASCO was to launch an innovation practice a few years back, and that was sponsored by both the product and the technology office. This practice supports and sponsors evolving modes of innovation, ideas worth exploring, evolving technology, and concepts that could fuel innovations uh, for ourselves as well as our customers. So in a specific customer problem opportunity that was brought forward, we were tasked with figuring out how we could evolve capabilities that we had, but that would improve productivity and create better outcome quality in our enrollment and billing operational organizations for health plans. 
So we built out a challenge statement. We felt that it depicted the difficulty and complexity our customers face in managing work and workforce in the most optimized way. We created and collected a group of the right participants for the workshop, as well as the customer, and they were key to not only conducting the interviews, but becoming part of the workshop itself. We got those insights, those tensions and challenges, as well as motivation, and we were fortunate to have that customer participation throughout the entire workshop with us as well. Yeah, just to give you a little bit background on this project, um, we added the business process management workflow component to our product. We were collecting a lot of data um, through that pro you know, workflow process, and we wanted to present that uh, on a business activity monitoring or what we call BAM dashboard uh, with some graphs and charts. We thought we knew what the solution would, was going to look like. So before even uh, the empathy sessions, we had some ideas, vague ideas, what it's going to look like in our mind. But as soon as we gone through the empathy session, things change drastically and very differently. Yeah, planning an engagement like this was uh, requiring some careful consideration. Like I just mentioned, we had some strict constraints that we had to adhere to from the technology and product, new flat product uh, standpoint, while trying to find ways to bring new technology and information to the users. So to do that, we conducted a series of uh, stakeholder interviews to really familiarize ourselves with the technology aspect of the product to understand more who these users would be and start to uh, structure our research efforts around very specific uh, topics. Uh, and this was at the beginning of our, this was a six week effort uh, that will help us arrive at the solution that met our user expectations in different ways and kind of and did it within the constraints of an already uh, existing effort. And uh, while we were working on the uh, challenge statement as Linda Lee mentioned, we also realized that um, we may need some newer technology for business activity monitoring that is not readily available to our, um, in our tool set. Um, so we had to keep an eye on the business challenge or business statement or the challenge statement and another eye on the technology challenge because we didn't have the technology in, in the house. So we have two problems at the same time to solve, but to bring the best solution, we have to bring the technology challenge and the business challenge together. And this is why design thinking requires a close collaboration and partnership between the technology organization and the business organization to solve the customer needs with the best possible way. That's right, and that's where we started. We started by better understanding the customer needs and by conducting user interviews with the folks that were engaged, so whether they were direct users, they were contributors, they were in leadership. Uh, we went on, we hit the road, we went on site, and we met with, uh, again, we, what we found is that, by the way, we conducted, uh, uh, I believe, six or seven different interviews to begin with, and what we were finding is that was started out to be one type of user that we were targeting. Actually, it was two different users, and there was two different personas that needed to have access to this information, but they needed to have it quite differently. So we put together two of these uh, customer or persona profiles, which you see here, focusing on specific empathy mapping of each one of these users. What are they hearing, seeing, thinking, doing? How has that impacted them? What are their motivations? What are some of the key uh, needs and pains they exhibited? And what are some of the key solution elements that they may be expressed? Uh, and armed with this information, we went into having our in-person uh, workshop where we brought together folks from product and business technology, design, and customers uh, to start ideating around how we can apply that challenge statement to these particular users with these challenges to be able to get the real results we were looking for. Yeah, and what becomes dynamic in these workshops is you, you do adapt the workshop to make sure that you're addressing the personas at hand and doing it in the most uh, creative and, and fitting way. And because we had two personas here, we did break into two teams to make sure we were solving for both of them. We generated a great number of ideas um, and we channeled those positive experience in other solutions and in other industries, things that we were used to 
experiencing in our daily lives so that it could help us envision what a transform experience might look like uh, to these different personas. Um, we definitely challenged our traditional boundaries of technology, as Ajaz mentioned. We didn't limit ourselves um, functionally, and, and we did make sure that we looked at the solution footprints as, as wide and big as we, as we could in thinking of, uh, of solutions. Splitting into teams was a very important part of this exercise and being able to, because uh, that helps us generate even more ideas, build more empathy through our discussions. Uh, it helps us map the workflows from different perspectives and be able to bring them together and see how much does that actually align and where does it differ. And it allows to generate new types of ideas. So I encourage everybody when you do these type of things, look for opportunities to form teams, give the teams very specific objectives to rally around and see what comes out on the other end. Yeah, so sitting in the in these uh, workshop as a technologist, I think I primarily think of uh, two things. One is how to use available technology to do more things better, faster, and cheaper. And two, is this problem already been solved, or if this challenge, specific challenge, is already been solved in any other industry, like say financial industry or something like that. And can I leverage if there is a solution and can I leverage that solution for our healthcare industry? So, for example, during the empathy interviews, when we heard that the customers has to go through um, multiple different systems to collect the KPI data and you then then use the spreadsheet to slice and dice the data to measure the team's productivity and activity, we knew we can do build automation to eliminate this pain. And that is what we actually did in this uh, going through this process. I also wanted to point out that um, design thinking workshop should not be just focused on the outcomes. Uh, but in fact, it should be focused on innovative ideas, building the better user experience, for example, that is intuitive. That's a simple thing to do. And sometimes uh, small things can reduce big pain points. So that is what uh, came out of this uh, with the ideas that we did. We built the dashboards um, for the customer where customers can go and configure what they want to see and how they want to see by themselves. So we took the customer centered approach in this case. And I think collab again, uh, collaboration is the key. Collaboration with the people who are good in doing different things. Uh, what you're not good at, right? I'm, I mean, I'm a technologist. I don't know much about business. So I work with the business team to understand what they're doing. And together, this group should take the challenge of building the creative ability take, to take on the problem that don't have the clear answer. Yeah, so as, as Ajaz talked about with the diversity of the teams and the fact that we had two focusing on different personas as we looked at the solution options and the solution ideas, we were actually able to test and vote on concepts across both teams. So bringing those different perspectives um, to, to each of the sets of ideas and also allowing us to step back and divorce ourselves from maybe our own, our own ideas and, and look at other ideas that were generated and, and provide some feedback. So um, the whole time we, we continue to make sure that the teams that were evaluating these ideas were putting that customer and that user back into focus. And at this stage, um, we focus on the solution that best address the business uh, pain point or improve our user experience. Um, so basically, uh, we had many ideas. We convert those ideas by kind of prioritizing it. And so we focus on problems that are, as uh, Anton says before, uh, those are viable for business, worth solving for customer or desirable, as well as uh, problems that are, um, if we are able to solve through technology, so technically it's feasible. That's what it is all about. The interesting part of this exercise was also that we not only, as we evaluated ideas, we came out with some things that were probably predictable. We knew that we were going to need them. And some things that kind of crossed the boundaries or were kind of pushing the limits of feasible and viable, but were definitely desirable. So this, this, uh, the point being is really, even if something still needs further exploration, but we know that those ideas are valuable, 
for the customer, keep them on the table and find like explore them before you shoot them down too early. And this is, so we want to narrow our focus down, but if we know that there's breakthrough opportunities for our users and our customers, again, like keep them around, see what comes up with. In our case, we were able to come up with quite a few different ideas to solve some problems we didn't expect when we started. So when we got to the point where we were ready to really look at a, a cohesive concept or idea, we used a, co a commercial pitch concept to share it with the worker participants. We, we had a very low res type of, of prototype really in the, in the way of a workflow, but we used that commercial pitch to really rally around how it solved the customer's problem, how it felt different from the old world to the new world. And that way the team was able to provide feedback as to how we could not only improve the concept, but also help us identify where it might fail or how it may, how well it really addressed the customer problem we were solving for. Yeah, I find this exercise to be incredibly powerful. Um, when you ask yourself, if I have 30 seconds to make a commercial about my product, who would be in it and what would they be doing? And you time box it like that, you have 30 seconds. It really focuses you to start uh, to hone in on the key values and the key story points. Uh, I always say start, keep it short, like five to six uh, story points, start in the beginning and then the end, and then fill in the middle. And then use that, and we, and this is what we did as well, is use that story then to start building your prototypes and your concepts on, because this becomes the straw man that we want to start hanging the uh, solution around. And then we were able to take those stories and create this concept. So what we were able to do is, as I mentioned, we had two different personas and we had slightly different challenges, but at the end of the day, we are, again, working within the constraints of an in-flight product, so we can't just go and build different solutions for different folks where we want. But what that meant is we had to think through both the needs uh, and then what's common and different about them and create one solution that was flexible enough to address the needs of both. Now, the solution also combined some, again, it was a very complicated data challenge, so we had to think through all kinds of ways of crunching data, coming up with new KPIs, and even some things that we found in this case that the customer really wanted, but wasn't data that we had regularly available and something that we had to look for. But again, by going through this exercise, by working with the constraints that we had and conducting the workshop the way that we did, and by using the story the way we did, we were able to design these screens and build a clickable prototype uh, around that story narrative, which we'll then be able to take back and test and validate with our uh, users and stakeholders. Yeah, I agree. I mean, turning the prototype concept into a real working prototype was really exciting. I, I couldn't believe how quickly we were able to do that. And then extremely useful for our customers to, to really touch and, and use and move around. I think uh, it allowed our users to provide true, real, authentic, critical input um, so that we could iterate on the concept and decide, you know, maybe where we missed the mark, maybe failed, failed quickly in a, in a place or two but without a lot of investment so we could pivot and make changes as needed. And I think we were pleased to find out that we did definitely hit on a solution that addressed the major problems and pain points. And, uh, and what also helped is it, it, uh, it made us validate our, our MVP product, but also gave us great ideas that would enrich um, our product backlog and against which we could continue to evolve this idea. Yeah, and then during this process, um, we knew that we have some technology limitations uh, or we may face some technology limitation, but we were open-minded about the outcome of this workshop. We didn't limit ourselves in terms of our thinking, in terms of those ideas. We said, fine, we have technology limitation, but we're gonna be out of the box. We're gonna think out of the box and we will be open-minded about it. So we brought that we, at the end, we brought the new technology and built the expertise and experience to support this new uh, business capability in our product. But by working with the um, users, uh, as uh, Antoine mentioned, the two different personas, we tested our assumptions and uh, with the prototype and we tested our theories. We wanted to make sure if we make mistakes, which everybody does, 
We wanted to make sure that if we make mistakes, we make mistakes early. Uh, if we're going to fail, we fail early. Making mistakes is part of the uh, continuous learning process, which basically means if you fail, you go back to the drawing board quickly. It's within the first phase of the sort of say project, it's the early stages of the work, right? That if you fail, that's fine. You go back into the drawing board. And then you want to add something to that? Yeah, I was just going to say absolutely. Like the, the ability to, like you say, fail early, fail often uh, is critical. So this uh, this process and the reason why we like talking about this uh, particular experience, this workshop, is because, again, we started out with, we thought we knew what we needed for the most part. Mm -hmm. We just need to fill in some details. We learned that people think slightly differently. So if we were to start building what we were set out to build, we probably would have missed the mark some. But by going through this process, taking it back, uh, and by the way, not only getting user validation, but at the same time, being able to do technology explorations and uh, proof of concept work right around some of this in parallel allowed us to validate that, yes, the solution is viable for business. We know that this meets our need. It is desirable for the customers. This addresses challenges they had, not just with our product, but with other elements of their workflow. And it is technologically possible. And we did that very, very quickly. Again, it was only, uh, a handful of weeks from start to finish to form a problem, to conduct interviews, conduct a workshop, design prototype, validate it, test it out technologically. And I just want to say that whether you are building a product or solving a complicated challenge, I know you're always moving a million miles an hour. It can be tough. Uh, you need to ship. But the goal is to balance this reality where they need to think in new ways to constantly push ourselves to think bigger uh, and whatever it is, blow it out proportion and see where it takes you. Uh, at the end of the day, this is what this process is all about. And I wanted to kind of leave you with, for my part, with this book, Change by Design. Uh, this is a, a great piece of literature. I think you guys should really pick it up. Uh, it is uh, really talks well about this process and different ways to implemented in your organizations. I hope everyone who attended today uh, found this session useful and uh, informative, uh, not only on just the overview and overall innovation process concepts that can be applied, but um, how we applied them in a real world setting. Um, and I open the, the floor up to field any questions that you might have. Thank you for joining us today. Andrea? Hey, thank you guys so much. Um, that was really informative. For those of you um, on the line, if you do have questions for our panelists, um, feel free to enter those into the Q&A. Um, I actually have a question for you guys um, while our um, attendees are maybe formulating some of their questions. I have been a part of this design thinking process and I think it's phenomenal. I wanted to know when is the right time to use design thinking? Does this work for every problem or, or does this work for every project that you might be on? I, I'll, I'll start on that one and uh, uh, Ajaz and Anton fill in. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things that can be applied to almost anything. Like I said earlier, it can be applied to uh, it, you know, external user problems or customer problems that can be used to tackle an internal uh, process inefficiency, um, even looking at some uh, organizational challenges, things that you, you want to work together to, to overcome. Um, again, starting with a, that empathy, that human-centered approach, starting there is essential to um, really understanding how you might uh, craft that challenge statement, what that problem needs to, that needs to be solved really is. Um, but I, I don't know that it's limited. I think, you know, it's, it's something that can be applied pretty broadly and you can also apply components of it. As long as you don't lose sight of that human centered approach, um, you can use components of it to, um, to be, you know, used as, as they're needed for the given situation. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't think there's a wrong time to apply design thinking. Ajaz, what are your thoughts? Yes, absolutely. You're right. And I think, uh, you know, sometimes we think that if it's a completely new uh, piece of business or new process, 
then we apply the design thinking. No, you can even apply the design thinking methodology on an existing process, you, which you may want to refine and improve and automate and uh, make it more productive, you know, productive or something like that. So, as you said, um, yeah, it can be applied to anything existing processes or a new challenge that you have. Um, if there is a challenge, there is a the design thinking session can occur for that. Anton. Yeah, I'm just going to say that um, at the end of the day, this is a mindset. That's the way that we think about I customers agree. and the way we think about users who bring them in. Uh, ideally, this type of thinking gets baked into the entire, just into the fabric of how we operate and how we solve problems. So to Rachel's point, whether you're starting from scratch or you need to add new features to your product, or you just want to explore if there is a possibility for improvement, right? This is where we really leverage these things. Thank you. Um, we do have a, a question about um, whether or not the collaborative sessions were done virtually or um, during the pandemic while remote or if they were in person, maybe pre-pandemic. So now that we're in a, a more virtual environment, how might you suggest those sessions be held virtually? I can start that one um, and then I'll, I'd love to hear from Anton and Ajaz. Yeah, the one that we uh, showcased was done in person. The interviews were done in person. Uh, they, it was pre-pandemic. I will say we have held design thinking sessions virtually since then um, and they can be done. There are tools, there's a lot of, there are a lot of great tools out there that can help with that engagement and the collaboration. I'll say from my personal experience, the Probably the toughest part of design thinking in a virtual world is the ideate uh, mode. And I, I, I don't know if others have experienced this, but in that particular mode of innovation, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of energy and just building on ideas and you in that in person, that face to face engagement uh, fuels that that part of the innovation uh, mode. And it is a little bit more challenging today, even with the tools that are out there, but they're quite sophisticated and there's a lot, um, they've come a long way. One area that virtual um, innovations uh, actually get advantage from doing them remotely or using digital uh, capabilities is actually the prototype. Prototyping takes on a, a much more elevated experience in, a, in more of a digital or virtual session than when you're in a room maybe using, you know, sticky notes and cardboard and things like that. But um, that's the good and the bad of doing them remotely, but they can be done, absolutely. Um, Ajaz or Anton, you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I think uh, Linda Leap, as you mentioned, um, we did both ways, uh, you know, in person and uh, remotely. Um, first of all, you have to overcome the challenge, what I call, can you hear me challenge, which we all learned in the last two years, right? Uh, there is always that challenge. Technology sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work. But besides that, one thing that I noticed in uh, remote sessions, remote, uh, you know, doing this, uh, and, you know, this kind of workshop or em empathy interviews, sometimes people are not open to speaking in, you know, in one to one in person, but they're very open to speaking virtually. And it goes vice versa. Sometimes some people speak in person and not speak or when, a, you know, when you are remote, so you will see that kind of thing. Plus, there's sometimes people are not used to writing using different tool sets. We use Miro, Miro, different, you know, uh, collaboration tools, WebEx and uh, Zooms and so on and so forth. So sometimes people have challenge using those type of tool uh, and putting instead of a sticky typing quickly and putting something out there on the whiteboard, right? With, with virtual whiteboard. So we, yes, those challenges are there, but there is pros and cons for doing both ways, I would say. Anta? Yeah, it's definitely, it really comes down to the facilitator and wow. how they approach the, uh, the problem. Um, at the end of the day, if you think about the traditional design thinking workshop approach, it is meant to be in-person and collaborative. And the reason why we do that is because, well, we get a lot of, value out of getting people out of their natural habitat, putting them in the room with each other, 
removing the technology constraints why we use sticky notes and markers because everybody knows how to write something on the sticky note and stick it to the wall uh, <laughs> and that works very well now when you do this remotely it's going to take a little bit longer but that's yeah. okay right because in person mm -hmm. like we did this this was a two and a half day in person workshop where we all came together and ideally through this if you're going to do this remotely obviously spending eight hours in a room together is different than spending eight hours in front of a screen so we need to think about that and just kind of spread those activities out a little bit mm -hmm. put a little bit more emphasis on group voting yeah. uh and discussion of ideas and and also maybe include a little bit more independent working sessions where folks can do homework if you will and come back with some ideas and sort of being on the spot and spread it out so that we don't spend more than a couple of hours a day on the on the webex together all great feedback um we do have other questions rolling in a very um engaged audience so that's great um how would you guys suggest a, an organization really get started with design thinking if if they're new to design thinking what what's the first step how did they take that plunge i can take that one i can if start you if you oh okay yeah so i, I was gonna suggest uh, first of all um i know when we began we brought in uh, somebody to kind of help us look at the, the processes that we had in place and come in and help hold an actual workshop, do a tr kind of a training session up front, just educating everybody on what design thinking is in a, in a workshop type setting. Um, practice each of those modes, uh, get out there and actually do that, that real empathy work, which can be sometimes hard and uncomfortable at first, but um, really getting in there and immersing yourself in the, the actual um, design thinking process is, is a good way to get started. Um, then at least training a handful of facilitators so that they can continue to, um, you know, cultivate that, that capability and that, that mindset and that engagement um, across your workforce. Um, we were able to operationalize our design thinking, um, the, the practice um, at NASCO which allowed um, uh, everyone to go to a virtual site, see the tools and tips and methods that were there, um, actually uh, reserve and sign up to hold a design thinking workshop, and then a way for our facilitators, um, we'll call them kind of our uh, super facilitators and our uh, supporting facilitators to get educated on their roles in uh, making design thinking happen for their, the organization. So uh, that's probably more of a, a, an operational way of approaching standing up design thinking, but um, we had, you know, used our innovation practice to, to really uh, put the support behind making this happen at NASCO and continuing to extend it uh, across the organization. Anton, uh, what are your thoughts? No, yeah, I agree. And I was just going to add that uh, it's also in addition to a, 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 pro a process and an actual like a way of working, it's also a cultural change that folks need to mm -hmm. go through. So I would say when first implementing design thinking, it should start with we want clearly defining problems and knowing what they are and why and embracing the fact that we believe that it is the people at the end of our products that really get impacted and benefit the most. Once we accept that as an organization, as something that we rally on and we build values around that, that's when we can start really implementing these methodologies and processes. Because as you can imagine, design thinking, like most of these type of things is, you know, as they say, if you believe it works or you believe it doesn't, you're probably right. So if we don't embrace this culturally, then, you know, it may not be as effective, but if we do, and if it's coming down from leadership that it is important and this type of focus on the customer is important, these things just start to naturally evolve, I, in my experience. Perfect. Um, it looks like we have a couple more questions coming in. I think we have a, at least time for one more. Um, it says, can we just do parts of design thinking or do you have to go through the whole process? Can you kind of pick and choose parts of, of the methodology or is it whole one big bam, wham, bam? I could start on and that can you one. Start? Yeah. Um, the answer is yes and no. Um, you, empathy is the foundation. That is the yeah. part that cannot be skipped. Like, do you have to prototype? 
No, you don't have to, but it is good to get your ideas out. Uh, do you have to test? No, you don't. But can you, I mean, and again, so, so we're kind of saying, can you ideate without knowing what the problem is and who you're solving it for? I suppose you could, but you probably shouldn't. So it's kind of, yes, pieces are interchangeable. The scope and breadth of how far you go depends on the situation you're in, the kind of problem you're solving, the constraints you have. But at the, the empathy piece of it, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to do user interviews. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do journey maps, but it does mean that you should do research. You should focus yourself around the customer uh, and that piece uh, cannot be removed. But everything else, again, how far you go is uh, up to you. Yeah, and, and I would build on that to say that um, within the modes, there's more than one way to actually accomplish a, a given mode of the of the frame, the methodology. So, you know, we talked about empathy can be done in a number of different ways through um, interviews or or different uh, user groups or, um, you know, other types of observations that, that really cultivate the empathy part of the, the overall methodology. We were able, we've been able to use components of the, of this design thinking approach in even uh, actually a recent example at NASCO was that we're all um, embracing and uh, challenged with making sure that we're meeting uh, some, some recent uh, mandate uh, regulations that have been coming out and frankly have been frequently changing um, and, and becoming more clear as to what those uh, those legal requirements are going to be. But at the same time, we felt it was essential to make sure that we didn't lose sight of the, the customer journey because at the heart of, of much of this legislation is to improve the cut the patient or the customer's healthcare journey. So we did start with that that very human centered approach, not only in the way that we looked at how we were going to solve for the mandate, but how we were going to make it a positive experience. And then we use components of this design thinking methodology to map out exactly where those touch points were with the customers, how would they feel about those experiences, and use those to guide and inform um, our priorities, and then the way that we were going to uh, go ahead and roll out the changes required for the mandate. So. You know, essentially, we ended up using components of this and applied um, the right ways of putting that human centered approach, even to a legal mandate and, and made sure that we we're solving not just the problem of we're getting our, a mandate uh, met, but also making sure that that experience was positive as well. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. On behalf of NASCO and x 2 I'd like to thank our esteemed panelists for sharing their insights with us. And a huge thank you to all of our attendees. We really appreciate your time and your attentiveness and being engaged. Um, and we really look forward to connecting with you again soon. Until then, be well. Bye. Bye, everyone.